Greetings and welcome to the Blue Owl Capital Corporation third quarter 2023 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. The question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the call, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the call over to Dana Sclafani, Head of Investor Relations. Thank you, you may begin. Thank you, Operator. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Blue Owl Capital Corporation's third quarter earnings call. Joining me this morning are our Chief Executive Officer, Craig Packer, and our Chief Financial Officer and Chief Operating Officer, Jonathan Lamb. We're also joined this quarter by senior members of our team, including Alexis Maggot, our Chief Credit Officer, and Logan Nicholson, who joined the firm in September and will serve as the Portfolio Manager for several of our diversified direct lending funds, including OBDC. I'd like to remind our listeners that remarks made during today's call may contain forward-looking statements, which are not a guarantee of future performance or results, and involve a number of risks and uncertainties that are outside the company's control. Actual results may differ materially from those in forward-looking statements as a result of a number of factors, including those described in OBDC's filings with the SEC. The company assumes no obligation to update any forward-looking statements. Certain information discussed on this call and in our earnings materials, including information related to portfolio companies, was derived from third-party sources and has not been independently verified. The company makes no such representations or warranties with respect to this information. OBDC's earnings release 10Q and supplemental earnings presentation are available on the investor relations section of our website at blueowlcapitalcorporation.com. With that, I'll turn the call over to Craig. Thanks, Dana. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. In the third quarter, we saw continued strong momentum, delivering excellent credit performance across the portfolio and another quarter of record earnings. Net investment income was $0.49 per share, reflecting our third consecutive quarter of record NII. This was driven by increased interest income due to higher rates, solid dividend income, and our resilient portfolio performance. These increased earnings translated into an attractive return on equity of 12.7%, in addition to growing distribution for our shareholders. Based on our earnings well in excess of the regular dividend, our board has declared a supplemental dividend for the third quarter of $0.08 cents per share, coupled with our previously declared regular dividend of $0.33, cents, this equates to total dividends paid for the third quarter of 41 cents. Reflecting our confidence in both the sustainability of NII and the continued credit performance of our portfolio, our board has also approved a two cent increase to our regular dividend, increasing the fourth quarter regular dividend to 35 cents per share. The business is generating record earnings and we continue to share those earnings with our shareholders. This is the second increase in our base dividend since the second quarter of 2022, and our total dividend of 41 cents for the third quarter represents a more than 30% increase in our total quarterly dividend during this period. Net asset value per share increased to $15.40, up 14 cents from the second quarter. This marks the highest NAV per share since our inception. Our non-accrual rate remains low at 0.9% of the fair value of the debt portfolio, with just three names on non-accrual, unchanged from last quarter. We continue to demonstrate our ability to resolve non-accruals and protect our principal. Since inception, we have deployed over $25 billion of capital and experienced a net loss ratio of only 15 basis points. Our borrower's operating performance remains solid, continuing to reflect the strength of the U.S. economy. Consistent with last quarter, our borrowers reported modest quarterly growth in revenues and EBITDA, with many borrowers delivering margin expansion as a result of price increases and moderating inflation levels. Borrowers' performance has grown steadily over the last past year. On a year-over-year -year basis, our borrowers reported revenue and EBITDA growth of roughly 10 to 12% for each of the last two quarters. Our largest sectors, software, insurance, food, beverage, and healthcare, continue to deliver strong results, 
reflecting the durable nature of these industries and the less discretionary services they provide. We believe the portfolio will continue to be resilient and to perform in line with our underwriting expectations. Even still, we are closely monitoring the impact of the higher weight environment on our portfolio. Over the course of this year, we have seen interest coverage levels come down as rates have increased, with coverage moving from 2.3 times to 1.8 times today. While the rate outlook today is higher than it was six months ago, the impact on coverage ratios has been meaningfully mitigated by better than expected operating performance. As a result, although rates are higher, we continue to believe interest coverage ratios will reach trough levels of mid one times in the first half of 2024. We expect that the vast majority of our borrowers will maintain an adequate coverage cushion and strong operating performance through this period. The list of borrowers who we believe could see more challenged liquidity needs remains small. Our underwriting and portfolio management teams remain very focused and engaged with these borrowers, and we believe any challenges will be manageable across our portfolio as a whole. We continue to be very pleased with the performance of our companies despite the higher rates. With that, I'll turn it over to Jonathan to provide more detail on our financial results. Thanks, Craig. We ended the quarter with total portfolio investments of $12.9 billion, outstanding debt of $7.1 billion, and total net assets of $6 billion. Our third quarter NAV per share was $15.40, a 14 cent increase from our second quarter NAV per share of $15.26. Largely attributed to the continued over earning of our dividends from NII, as well as the net unrealized gains in the portfolio. Year over year, we have grown NAV by 3.7%, in addition to paying out 10.2% in distributions, which equates to a total return of 13.9%. In terms of deployment, we continue to largely match originations with repayments to maintain a fully invested portfolio. OBDC had $500 million of new investment commitments, of which $387 million were funded, offset by the $390 million of repayments for the quarter. The weighted average total yield of the portfolio was 11.8%, up from 10% in the third quarter of the prior year. Turning to the anchor statement, we earned a record 49 cents per share in the third quarter, up from 48 cents per share in the prior quarter. Based on these results, our board declared a supplemental dividend of 8 cents per share for the third quarter of 2023, which will be paid on December 15th to shareholders of record on November 30th. For the fourth quarter of 2023, our board has increased our regular dividend to 35 cents per share which we believe is still a very comfortable level relative to our earnings power. And we expect to continue to declare and pay supplemental dividends quarterly to provide further distributions to shareholders. The fourth quarter dividend will be paid on or before January 12th to shareholders of record as of December 29th. Since we instituted the supplemental dividend in the third quarter of 2022, we have paid out 28 cents of additional dividends per share. This dividend structure provides increased income to our shareholders while also allowing us to build NAV through excess earnings. As a result, we have 26 cents of spillover income through the end of the third quarter. OBDC continues to benefit from its flexible balance sheet and well-diversified financing structure. Overall, we continue to maintain significant liquidity of $1.9 billion, and we ended the quarter with net leverage of 1.13 times, in line with the prior quarter and within our target range. With that, I'll turn it back to Craig for closing comments. Thanks, Jonathan. I'd like to spend some time addressing one of the most frequent questions we're hearing today. How will borrowers fare in the higher for longer rate environment? Interest coverage is the metric that is most widely cited, 
and it is certainly a meaningful high-level statistic to assess the health of the portfolio. However, in our ongoing portfolio monitoring, we evaluate borrowers on many different metrics to give us a more comprehensive perspective. In addition to interest coverage, free cash flow, and liquidity expectations, we believe loan to value and potential equity owner support are also key considerations in assessing the overall health of our borrowers. Over the course of the year, private equity owners have been proactive in addressing the higher rate environment through cost-cutting initiatives and liquidity management. These include reducing operating costs, improving working capital, and reducing capital expenditures and acquisition spending. We believe these actions and the sponsor's willingness to support the business with additional equity when needed are critical components to the preservation of long-term value for these businesses. While we have had a limited number of comprehensive credit amendments this year, sponsors have contributed additional capital in 70% of these cases. An important part of our underwriting assessment is loan to value. On average, we invest at approximately 40% loan to value. Even in a lower valuation environment, the sponsors retain significant equity investments in their companies. While not contractually required, this means that the private equity firms have a strong economic motivation to continue to support the business. It also means that if we need to take over a business, we believe we will have the opportunity for a very high recovery. Of course, all this doesn't minimize the amount of time and effort that it takes to work through more challenging situations. We have both the resources and the time horizon associated with our permanent capital base to work with borrowers to provide the operating runway needed to, to optimize value. We continue to invest in our team with over 115 investment professionals today, reflecting our commitment to ensure we have the resources necessary to work on troubled situations and protect our portfolio. To close, I wanted to spend a minute on the current market opportunity and our outlook for the fourth quarter and into next year. Deal activity has picked up nicely since the first half of the year, driven by increased refinancings, add-on acquisitions, and new buyout activity. We have seen the reopening of the public markets, which has led to some tightening of spreads. However, we are still able to earn 11 to 12% returns on Unitrust loans, which we believe is a very attractive absolute return on new opportunities. Direct lenders continue to provide a compelling financing solution for borrowers of scale, and we've had notable success leading the financings on many of the largest deals announced in recent months, including the multi-billion dollar refinancing facilities for Anastra and PetBet. In many of these larger deals and across our broader portfolio, we typically serve as the administrative agent, which is not just a technical title, but instead it is an important role awarded to only one lender on each deal. As the administrative agent, we are in direct dialogue with the borrower and sponsor in shaping the transaction terms and the credit documentation. In addition, this role uh, allows our team to maintain a frequent dialogue with the borrower over the life of the loan, which gives us the singular best insight into its operating performance and liquidity profile on a real-time basis. Our franchise continues to win this important role across some of the most attractive deals in the market. In recent months, we have committed to seven deals with financing sizes over $1 billion and serve as the administrative agent on five of them. We believe this reflects the confidence that the private equity sponsors have in our firm. We are also seeing the benefit from incumbency with roughly 70% of our origination this quarter deployed into existing borrowers, reflecting both our confidence in our borrowers and the power of this growing incumbency, with 187 borrowers in the portfolio today. Looking forward, we expect deal activity will continue to rebound as valuations and the rate environment stabilize, driving increased interest in M&A by both companies and sponsors. We believe this more robust market environment will lead to a continued increase in repayment activity, which could drive further income for OBDC and allow us to redeploy capital into the new opportunities. 
Finally, I just want to reflect on OBDC's continued success and what a strong quarter this was. This is our third quarter of record NII. We achieved the highest NAV since our inception, and we del delivered an attractive ROE of 12.7%. Credit performance remains strong and is driving consistent earnings and increased distributions to shareholders. We expect that our portfolio will continue to perform well, and we will be able to deliver strong operating results and returns to our shareholders. With that, thank you for your time today, and we'll now open the line for questions. Thank you. We will now be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. The confirmation total indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star two if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for your questions. Our first questions come from the line of Brian McKenna with JMP Securities. Please proceed with your questions. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so just a question on the dividend to start. You know, coverage of both the regular and supplemental dividends has been running around 120% year to date. So I guess is this a reasonable expectation for the next few quarters, assuming no material shift in the rate backdrop, and then you know, also continued healthy underlying credit trends across the portfolio? Uh, sure, Brian. Uh, good morning. Um, we, uh, you know, we felt really comfortable increasing the base dividend. Obviously, the supplemental dividend has worked really well and delivered additional um, dividends to shareholders. Um, we certainly feel extremely comfortable with this new base, and, and you know, I think folks should expect us to continue to pay this uh, going forward with the conditions that you suggested. Um, if the portfolio continues to perform well and rates continue to stay high, you know, we clearly have, you know, a little additional room as well. So we uh, feel really comfortable where we are, and, and if conditions warrant, you know, we will always evaluate whether whether we should increase it. Um, but I think it's uh, a good representation of where we sit right now. Got it. Helpful. Um, and then switching gears a little bit. You know, so if I look at the average investment size of your portfolio companies, it's been holding steady around $70 million the last several quarters. You know, that said, I know the broader Blue Owl platform is more focused on, on the large end of the market and deal sizes in, in this part of the industry continue to trend upward. So how should we think about the size of new investments and then kind of the, the overall average size of the portfolio at OBDC over time? Sure. We've been really pleased with the number of large, high-quality new investment opportunities. I talked a minute ago about $7 billion deals, five of which we're leading. Um, we continue to see this trend um, in this quarter and in our pipeline uh, with large companies tapping direct lending more and more. So I think that's very exciting, um, particularly because the quality of the companies are very high. As for the, our position size, um, as a platform, when we sign up these new deals, our aggregate uh, investment is quite large. Um, could be four, five, six, seven hundred million dollars in total investment across our platform. When it comes to sizing uh, OBDC specifically, it's really a function of um, our capital available at the fund at, at that moment in time. Um, the fund is in, you know, squarely in our target leverage level, and so we are sizing new investments um, essentially um, to replace repayments. And so in this quarter, we got it. I think it's as perfectly uh, accurate as you can get it, um, but it, it can be a little bit, a little bit lumpy. So if we get more repayments and those repayments are of greater size, then we would love to put, um, you know, marginally larger investments in, in this, in OBDC. Um, having said all that, you know, I really like the increased diversification we've, we've been able to achieve over the last couple of years. And so, you know, that's also a goal. Um, so, you know, any one, two or three quarters is not going to change the average size of the portfolio given the number of names in it. Um, at 187 names, it would take um, a lot of a lot of turnover. But I, I think the average size probably won't drift much higher over time, um, which I think is a good thing, you know, because the diversification is, is very attractive. Great. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Our next questions come from the line of Robert Dock with Raymond James. Please proceed with your questions. 
Hi guys, uh, and congrats on on the quarter. I mean, two questions. I mean, one, your, your comments on on liquidity and, and interest coverage, etc., uh, Craig, are uh, very helpful. I mean, have you seen um, any change in, in revolver draws at the portfolio companies? I mean, you disclose all the, the unfunded commitments, but it's sometimes hard to see um, when they they move from one quarter to the next or whatever. Whether those are getting drawn or the commitments are expiring or whatever. So have you, have you seen any change in pattern there, or is it just, you know, regular course of business? Uh, thanks, Robert. Um, no change in behavior on revolvers. You know, business as usual. Um, you know, companies use revolvers, um, you know, to fund the, the short-term liquidity needs of their business, and um, no change, in, you know, along, in, in those regards. Our companies are performing really well. You know, I highlighted some of the statistics, but we've been really pleased with, the strong operating performance, revenue growth, EBITDA growth, both quarter over quarter, year over year. Um, and so uh, nothing of note to, to comment on revolvers. I think it reflects just the overall strength of the portfolio company performance. Got it. Thank you. On, on the, the second one, I mean, on, on the outlook, I mean, as you said, I mean, you, 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 you're, you're winning some very large deals. Um, uh, and, you know, are you, do you expect 2024 to kind of, Obviously, it's it's very hard predicting the future, but um, but do you expect that kind of you know, to continue that theme? You know, more deals, bigger deals, and, and a rebound in the market, or are you do you think you know the the, the near term is maybe a a spurt of activity by the industry, and and could it could it level off again? Any thoughts there? Uh, I'm I'm um. I'm pretty optimistic that 2024 will we'll see a significant pickup in activity. We're, you know, we're seeing that already as we look to the fourth quarter of this year. I, I noted all that in my comments. Um, you know, our pipeline of deal activity for the fourth quarter looks good, both in terms of repayments and new activity. Um, there's a lot of pent up um, appetite from the private equity firms to exit portfolio companies. Um, for those of you that follow the private equity industry, You'll, you'll be aware that private equity fundraising is more challenged because private equity firms have not had the opportunity to return capital to their LPs um, as much as they would like, um, given some of the uh, volatility over the last 12 months. They would like to exit their companies, and that is the single biggest driver of, of deal activity. And so we're seeing that you know, beginning to happen. Um, and I think if we get stability in the rate environment, um, and in, in the markets, and the economy stays uh, in a reasonable place, I think they'll see a, a meaningful pickup in M&A activity that will drive um, new deals for us. Um, you will also see a uh, pickup in finan refinancings um, in our portfolio. Um, what we're, we've been really pleased with is there have been some really sizable companies of very high quality um, that had been previously financed in the public markets that are increasingly choosing to refinance in the private markets. Um, Finastra, you know, PetVet would be two great examples, Hi Highland. Um, this is, a, I think, an extremely strong um, trend for direct lenders, um, such as OBDC. These are large companies, um, and they offer us really attractive risk-adjusted returns. And we're seeing some. I think they're going to continue to see uh, meaningfully more in 2024. So I'm, I'm optimistic about deal activity. Um, both in terms of, of repayments, um, income generation off of those repayments, as well as deploying capital in, in high quality situations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question has come from the line of Ryan Lynch with KBW. Please proceed with your questions. Hey, uh, good morning and, and, and nice quarter, uh, guys. Um, one of the questions I had was, you know, you've talked a lot about, um, you know, some large deals that you guys are, are, are leading, uh, as well as potentially the pickup in 2024. There's a lot of loans coming from the broadly syndicated loan market that are now going to the, the private credit route. I think you mentioned some from PetVet, Finastra, Highland, just a, an example of a few that, that you guys are, are either leading or participating in. Can you maybe just speak to the notion that that some of these these large borrowers that were maybe in, in the the broadly syndicated loan market before are choosing the the private credit solution versus not being able to access the, the broadly syndicated loan market? Uh, that that this is more of a a choice versus uh, 
them not being able to access that, and that and that's why they're they're coming to the private credit side. Uh, sure. Um, look, it, you know, it's obviously there's a multitude of factors, um, but I think that this phenomenon is extremely attractive for private credit. Um, the public loan market, um, by far, the dominant purchaser of those loans are CLOs. Um, in strong market environments, when CLO, cre CLO creation is high, CLOs, CLOs have lots of cash um, and can deploy, and they do so, um, you know, at, at, at reasonable spreads. Um, but when those factors are not in place, then the largest buyer base is missing. Um, CLO creation has been spotty this year. Um, there have been times when it's been light. There's been times when it's rebounding. You know, it's, bump it's bumping around. Um, CLOs need a certain ratings profile. And the rating agencies have a certain rubric that they use to evaluate credits. Um, and so if you get a certain rating, you can go to the public markets. You can't, you don't get it for whatever reason, um, you can't. The other factor is the private equity firms have become um, sensitized that even when they have a deal that is issued in the public markets and they get a rating, that over time they are vulnerable to that rating changing, leaving them with lack of access to the public markets. And that risk is one that they have had to live with, um, but they no longer have to live with because the private credit markets, we can do our own independent work, our own credit analysis, um, and make our own judgments about the credit worthiness. And we don't have that short-term time horizon if there's a downgrade. And so the private equity firms have become more and more comfortable <clears throat> just choosing a private credit solution with the certainty, the privacy, the customization, um, and the private equity firms are willing to pay a premium uh, for that. Um, so I think this is um, a great trend for our, for our investors to get access to these extremely high quality companies. Um, and so it's part choice. In some cases, there may be companies that just don't have the ratings profile or they're trying to finance in a market where CLO creation um, is light. Um, you know, generally private credit, we can also offer customization that the public markets can't offer. Um, we can offer maybe a bit more leverage for a high quality company. Again, we're financing at 40% loan value. Um, so I think it's a combination of these things, but I would very much look at it as an opportunity for, for our portfolio to invest in high quality businesses. Um, you know, and we're and that, that opportunity set is growing and we have more to choose from. And our capital base as an industry is allowing much bigger financings to get done in private credit markets. So I think it's very much a sign of strength um, and something the sponsors tell us regularly that they like and would like to see more uh, ways to finance in the private markets. Okay, that, that's really helpful background and color on that. Um, the other question I had was, uh, your guys' credit quality has, has, has fared really well. You know, as, as shown by the low non accruals and, and, and really nice NAV performance. Um, but you mentioned something on the call that I was curious on, and I want to make sure I, I, I got the number correct. But I believe you said with, with some of the performance related amendments that you guys have, have made in your portfolio, uh, private equity sponsors have contributed 70% uh, of, of capital in, in 70% of those cases, I should say. I'm just curious, on the, the remaining 30% that the private equity sponsor didn't contribute additional capital into, was that because that was not a request that, that you guys had made? Was that something that the private equity sponsor was unwilling to do, or was that something that the private equity sponsor maybe just didn't have any capital remaining in that, that fund to do so? I'd just love to get a little color on that remaining 30% uh, where, where <clears throat> private equity capital wasn't contributed. Sure. Um, you know, every situation is unique. Um, you know, we, uh, and I think that's, again, one of the great attributes of, of, of private credit. If you have a broadly syndicated loan and there's a credit problem, there's nobody to talk to. Your loan's hold by, by 200 CLOs that you don't know. You have no ability to have a negotiation. You know, we have, we have a bilateral loan. Um, we are, we typically own more than half of it. And the sponsors like being able to call us and discuss what's going on with the company. Um, one of the main things on our list to, to ask for is equity. If, if the company, in our opinion, needs some deleveraging, um, you know, that is always very high on our list. Um, but there are situations where a company might be bumping into a covenant um, where it can comfortably cover its interest and maybe we priced a high quality loan at a spread where 
leverage is mildly elevated and it doesn't require new equity, it requires some type of economic solution. And so in those cases, you know, we will work out a different type of solution with the private equity firm. Maybe we'll ask for additional call protection or some repayments. There's a lot of ways for us to um, solve problems with the private equity firms. Um, equity is certainly one that we really like for obvious reasons, but you know, it's not um, the, the, uh, the solution in every case. The general answer to your question is in our material amendments, um, we have very um, amicably reached um, good solutions for us in the private equity firms. It's, you shouldn't read it as a sign that we just had to amend the deal and couldn't get what we wanted and had to suffer through it. That's not representative of the other 30%. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks for the color on that. Uh, that's all for me today, appreciate the time. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Our next questions come from the line of Mark Hughes with Truist Securities. Please proceed with your questions. Yeah, thanks. Good morning. Um, following on that, the uh, um, amendment activity, um, I don't know if you suggested whether you'd seen any trend there, whether it ticked up steady. Um, obviously, you're getting a lot of uh, private equity support, but how has the trend been lately? I would say it's been very light. You know, it's really, you know, I, in, in a good way. I mean, we, at the beginning of the year, you know, I was quite cautious given rates were higher. You know, I, I had expected by now we would have uh, more stress in the portfolio. We really haven't seen it. Um, you know, it's it's low single digit amount of amendment activity, garden variety um, amendment activity. We haven't seen any pickup. Um, and um, I would say it's, it's 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 lighter than anybody you know would have expected. I'm quite I'm quite pleased with it. Um, you know the stats we gave on sponsor support. You know we're really that's over the course of the last 12 months. Really, um, you know the last quarter this quarter was a was a really light um, amendment uh, quarter. And um, you know sitting here into the fourth quarter, you know, it, it, it remains light. And we'll see how the rest of the quarter plays. Yeah, yeah. The uh, 10 to 12 percent EBITDA growth. I think you suggest the suggested for the last couple of quarters um, is pretty impressive. Do you have a sense of whether there's an expectation for that to slow as, as the Fed does its work? Um, any nuance on the economy here? Sure. Um, so just to be clear, the 10 to 12 percent that I referenced was a year over year statistic for revenues to EBITDA. Um, and I also referenced in my comments um, quarter over quarter growth, that that growth is, is in the low single digits. So quarter over quarter continued growth, but, but at a lower level, year over year, um, more significant growth. Um, I think what we've been most pleased with is just the, the breadth of the, of the performance. It's really in all of our sectors and, and most of our companies. Um, and so we're, we're, we're pleased with it. You know, I just want to remind everyone I don't think of our portfolio as a, a perfect representation of the U.S. economy. We are very purposefully focused on recession-resistant businesses that we expect to be stable in most economic environments, sectors like software, healthcare, food and beverage, insurance, um, insurance, et cetera. Um, we are not trying to be uh, an early warning sign for economic weakness. We have almost little to no exposure in um, commodity in commodity uh, sectors like energy and chemicals and home building um, and retail and restaurants. And these are the sectors that you know you would look to um, as early warning signs. As an example, um, you know we had a you know, very significant strike in the in the auto industry, which has now been settled. I mean we have literally almost zero exposure to the auto industry in our entire portfolio. Um, so I'm pleased with the performance. Um, if the economy stays the way it is, um, I expect that performance to continue. Um, we do have some businesses that are exposed to just general industrial conditions or general consumer demand. Um, and so, you know, we'll watch that uh, closely. Um, if the economy stays strong, before we'll do well. If the economy goes uh, and has a downturn, which I think at this point, most economic observers that I, I follow um, think we, we will avoid a recession. But if they had a mild recession, we still think, our portfolio will, will do uh, really well. Um, so um, cautiously optimistic, but but you know we'll feel better, um, you know as as the as the next twelve months unfold. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, 
please press star one on your telephone keypad. Our next questions come from the line of Eric Swick with HubD Group. Please proceed with your questions. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, just wanted to start with a question. Uh, one, I appreciate all of the, the detail that you put in the slide deck and just looking through uh, a bunch of that. And notice as I look at the uh, the new uh, investments, both the uh, average interest rate and, and average spread uh, has come down over the, the past two quarters. But you know, given the increase in base rates, you've still been able to exhibit some some increase in the um, you know the, the weighted average yield in the portfolio. So just just curious, kind of given those you know the, the two trends of the declining. Uh, rates on and spreads on and new opportunities. Uh, you know, so far is obviously up a little bit uh, from from 6:30 to 9:30. So I would think there's maybe a little bit more opportunity to expand the overall yield. But would you think, kind of given those trends, if interest rates hold in a cycle, you kind of near the the peak of the yield for the portfolio for this cycle, or are there other opportunities to kind of hold the line there? Uh, sure. So I'll you know, make a couple of comments. Um, look, the last the last couple of quarters have been. You know, this quarter was a little more active, but these are light quarters um, from a volume standpoint. Um, so they're not going to have a, a meaningful impact in the overall return in the portfolio because, you know, they're, they're a small sliver of the portfolio. If you look at the average spread that we have in the book, um, it, you know, it has been a rock solid for five quarters in a row, pinned at 6.7%. Um, and so it wouldn't read too much into any one or two quarters worth of activity. Um, I did note in my comments um, this quarter, as the public markets have, have reopened, um, we have seen a bit of tightening of spread. Um, and so, you know, I, spreads had been really wide in the first half of this year. Public markets shut, other private credit providers pulling back. It was, that was a great opportunity for us to get lots of spread. Um, and that, that is waning a bit. They're seeing some tightening of spread. Absolute returns still extremely high, 11 to 12 percent. I made the comment in the script. Um, so, um, you know, I do think that these these market conditions will move up and down on a given quarter based on um, what's happening in the quality syndicated markets, based on what our peers are doing with their capital. Um, the base rate environment extremely attractive. Overall returns for new deals extremely attractive. Um, are we at the? You know, I think that you're asking forward looking. Are we at the peak? You know, I, it's hard to say. It's just so market dependent. Um, I think that, you know, that our expectation, investor expectation on um, rates right now is a growing sentiment that maybe rates are at a peak and will come down. Certainly the forward curve would suggest that. I mean, as to where spreads will go, um, that is, you know, a function of, as I just said, market appetite and, 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 and where additional capital will deploy. Um, we're always trying to get the, the best of both worlds. We want to have great credits and great credit protections and, and get as much spread as we can, you know, but, but we certainly have um, competitive, uh, competitive environment that, um, that we live with. Um, so I, I'd be very pleased if it stayed like this uh, for, for a while. So, you know, if we could do a little bit better, we can. Um, I do think deal flow activity will pick up and that will generate some, um, some prepayment income that we haven't had for a while. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, these are really attractive returns and really attractive spreads, the likes of which, you know, 18 months ago, 12 months ago, we're on these calls. Um, I don't think anyone expected. And so we're, we're certainly um, very pleased pleased with what we're seeing. Um, but it, it'll, it'll move up and down. But spreads operate in a general band, um, you know, but 550 to 700 over, depending. And we've moved in and up in that band, down in that band. Uh, over the last, you know, since our existence, every quarter we've operated somewhere in that band. Right now it's on the tighter end. Um, it could widen out. All it takes is some dislocation in the broadly syndicated markets for a quarter or two, and spreads will widen out again. That's very helpful. I appreciate the, the detailed comments there. And, and second one for me, just on leverage, the um, you know, leverage has come down over the past two quarters, you know, closer to the lower end of your your target range. Curious, one if, if that was you know purposeful or more just reflective of the fact that there's been more exits and repayments relative to to new commitments over the past couple quarters. Yeah, I mean, it, it was basically flat this quarter versus last quarter, but it has come down from earlier in the year. Again, it's it's mostly a timing um, issue. We're matching repayments and new investments, and so we're you know we're sort of squarely in like call it that 115 area. We could take it up a little bit, uh, but we're we're certainly happy where we are, and and certainly operating a little bit higher, which is where we were operating earlier. 
I wouldn't I wouldn't read anything into it. I mean, it's well, you know what I'm really pleased at is even with a tick lower of, of leverage, our ROE is extremely high. So um, I think it's a great combination of great returns with some dry powder. And so you know we can invest, we you know, see great opportunities, we take the leverage up a bit. I really like where we sit in our in our target leverage range. Thanks for taking my questions today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next questions come from the line of Mickey Schlein with Ladenberg. Please proceed with your questions. Uh, yes, good afternoon. I, I just have one question uh, at this point. I um, wanted to ask, when do the reinvestment periods in your CLO financings begin to end? And how significant could that unwinding be on your interest expense over the next couple of years when you consider the current terms available in the market? Thanks, Mickey. So, yeah, our CLO uh, reinvestment periods are typically two to four years, generally more four years. And so they're on a regular basis, um, you know, sort of coming close to uh, when they're coming close to or within a year of, of uh, effectively that um, reset period, we will go out and do a reset. So that has already occurred. Um, you know, in, in some of our CLOs and will continue to be, be the case. We're not, we're not that concerned in terms of what that will look like from a financing cost perspective, from a repricing, you know, repricing of those transactions. Um, on the unsecured side, you know, obviously we do have lower cost financing there. Uh, again, nothing really material in 2024. Uh, in future years, we do have some uh, refinancings there that will uh, that that will come up, and we'll we'll be doing those in, in you know accordingly in those future years. Uh, Jonathan, if I can just follow up, I mean AAA spreads in the CLO world are are still pretty wide. Um, that's the reason that the the, the machine's not working very well. Um, so, are you indicating? that those spreads available in the market today are sort of similar to where you're already at or because a of your bit, platform? A little bit Hello? wider, a little bit wider, but not, not meaningfully much wider from where we printed all of these CLOs. Again, we have a fair number of CLOs in this, um, in, in OBDC, and some of them were printed at wider levels. The later ones a little bit tighter, but the earlier ones a little bit wider. And I think we're, okay. you know, old, yeah. I understand. Uh, those are all my questions. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have reached the end of our question and answer session. I would now like to turn the floor back over to Craig Becker for any closing comments. Great. Thanks all for joining. We're extremely pleased with the quarter. Um, hopefully the results speak for themselves, uh, but we're really excited to deliver the dividend increase in particular. Um, and the supplemental dividend continues to work uh, well and uh, just um, very happy. So thanks all for joining. If you have any questions as a follow-up, you know, we're easily reachable and, and, and would be pleased to, uh, to take them. And with that, hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. This does conclude today's teleconference. We appreciate your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Enjoy the rest of your day.